I was born in Cuba. Uh, I come from a very interesting family. Uh, on my mother's side, uh, intellectuals, professors, musicians. Uh, on my father's side, um, also intellectuals, but with a farming background. My grandmother was born in a very tiny farm, cacao farm, in northeastern Cuba, in a place, uh, in a region that we call Baracoa, which is the region that produces cacao in Cuba. And um, she was raised in a tiny farm called Cañas, in eastern, northeastern Cuba, uh, in, a, in a broad region that is called Oriente. Uh, so it's the easternmost part of the country very secluded, uh, isolated for years, and, and basically cut off from the rest of the island. So you develop a very interesting culture without interferences from any other part of Cuba. So therefore, it has a, its own cuisine. Uh, the cacao there you know, used to be fantastic. Um, it's gone through a process of growth. Uh, problematic is a problematic crop uh, for political reasons, but we're not going to talk about that. But the thing is that that's the, uh, that's the paternal background. Uh, and I, I was a part of it, and I really didn't know how important it was for me as a, as a human being until I um, started traveling through cacao-growing countries of Latin America, researching a book that had nothing to do with cacao, researching a big book called Gran Cocina Latina that I just, uh, I just published it. It's October 1st. It came out in the U.S. Uh, is coming out in, in England in uh, November. Uh, so I was traveling throughout Latin America and I, I gravitated instinctively towards cacao farms and cacao farmers. And, and one thing led to the other and I met in Venezuela, I met a um, very influential man, Jorge Redmond, who uh, was the owner uh, of a fantastic chocolate company called El Rey. It's the best chocolate company in Venezuela, and they, at that point, uh, they were trying to um, export their chocolate to the U.S., and we had seen each other briefly um, at an event in Miami, a food conference, where I was a moderator, and he really liked the way I handled the panel, which is very difficult, very difficult people involved there, so he's kind of liked the idea that I could uh, control you know, an unruly group. And uh, so he said to me, uh, how would you like to, uh, to help us out uh, in introducing our first line of couvertures to the US? And I said, I had no experience with marketing, but I, I believe it's all common sense. It's about interaction with people. So I said, sure, why not? Um, but I said, I, I'm writing this huge book. And what I need to do besides, you know, charging you for my services, it's the, uh, uh, the added bonus is that I need help traveling through Venezuela. I knew they had private planes. I knew they had all the connections. And so it happened. It was a mutually beneficial uh, interaction. And I started working for them. And I, um, I was instrumental in popularizing two very important concepts that were alien to the industry at the time. Uh, the concept of single origin, which was very new. Uh, the only company at the time that had done anything with it was Valrona. And it was very rudimentary and all romantic because all those place names that they use for their chocolates were inventions. Like Guanaja has nothing to do with Honduras. Guanaja is an island in Honduras uh, where Columbus saw cacao beans for the first time. But it was a romantic notion uh, because there's no cacao from Honduras there. But they impressed the public as to the regional uh, diversity of cacao, and that prepared the ground for us. So when El Rey started creating their couvertures, they were very clear about the place of origin, and they were not afraid to say it. So it was cacao from the northeast um, part of, uh, you know, the northeast of Caracas, an area called Barlovento, with incredibly delicious and complex cacao with a baseline of Criollo, uh, mostly Trinitarios, even some Amazonian cacao, but the, the flavor profile was fantastic. And they were happy to say it. This is uh, Carenero from this particular area, and they gave percentages, which is something that Valrona had already done. Uh, the idea was to bring this to the U.S. and show uh, consumers two things. First of all, 
this is single origin, it has percentages, and second, that Venezuela produced the finest cacao in the world. That was the message. Uh, and I believed, it, I believed that wholeheartedly at the time. I, I was impressed by the flavor profile of Venezuela cacao. I love the criollo, the pure criollos, genetically pure. I'm talking about something genetically pure um, from the area south of Lake Maracaibo. I tasted porcelana, which is like the holy grail of cacao. Uh, wasare, which had been found near uh, Colombia and had been brought to a lower altitude uh, near Merida. I tasted the first pots from you know, some of the trees there. And I made chocolate with some of the dry beans. I targeted um, chocolatiers, chocolate makers, and writers from different regions in the US. I kind of divided the US into regions. And I said, okay, like, who are we going to bring from the West Coast? So it's Emily Lucchetti or uh, Elizabeth Faulkner of um, people who were extremely active and, and, and who were very promising. When I chose the people of the East Coast, I chose Francois Bayard, very famous. A French chocolatier, who at that time was not even independent. He was working as a pastry chef for Daniel Bouloud, a very famous chef in the US. Uh, but he, I knew that he would strike gold on his, on his own. Um, I brought um, a man named Bill Joseph, who was working for a very famous restaurant called Boulet. And it so happens that he's now the pastry chef at the White House. So uh, I brought the top food writers in the, in, in the US. And essentially, each trip had a number of chocolate makers, chocolate um, chocolatiers mostly, pastry chefs, or even chefs. And I would bring uh, a couple of fantastic writers to cover the way these people interacted with the cacao farmers and, and with El Rey. And so stories came out. Um, so it was really great. For El Rey, it created a foundation. And then my job was also to talk about the work of El Rey single origin and Venezuela in events that I did in all the restaurants of the people who had come with us. So it was a market, that was my marketing strategy and it worked. At the same time, uh, people were becoming aware of single origin, which really, it was just the little Valrona incursion. So it was a ray, and this is something that a lot of people don't know. It was a Latin American company that really popularized that that buzzword that still is very much alive and that dominates the industry, and I had a lot to do with it, so I'm very proud. The, the idea of writing a book just came very naturally. I was giving a talk about cacao and chocolate in San Francisco at the Fancy Food Show, which is very big, and very influential writers and editors were there, and one of them from 10 Speed Press, which is a great, it's now an imprint of Random House, um, but at the time it was independent. Just they came to me and they said, um, would you like to write a book about this? Because you seem to know a lot. And I said to myself, yeah, I think I do know a few things. Um, and I started looking at the notes of my, my talks. And I said, I have a book. Uh, I'm, in fact, the uh, publisher and the editor said, why don't you send us the, um, what you talk, your talk? And that talk sold, sold the book. Um, so we talked about photography. I, I like to take my own photography, but I also hired fantastic Latin American photographers to come with me. And it was a journey basically through Latin America. It was sort of a return trip to a lot of the places that I had already visited doing my, my cookbook. So it worked out fantastically well. And uh, I had already gotten so much experience about chocolate making. Um, from being at the factory with El Rey. So I learned everything from A to Z uh, about it. And I realized how much I knew and how much I had read about the topic. And it wasn't even asked of, of me. I just uh, felt that if I was representing El Rey and I was talking to these chefs that I needed to have enough information to convey, to use the product correctly. And, and that's exactly what I did. And I used it in the book. And, but I think one of the most touching parts of the research was to come back, to go back to Cuba again. And I went on an assignment for a magazine called Saver Magazine, it's very big in the US, and I was doing a story about returning to Cuba. And the story was about two families, one in Havana, another one in Santiago, my own family. Uh, and what happened is that the Havana story didn't work out, I didn't like the people, and um, when I went to Santiago, where I was born, 
uh, my family was too poor and they didn't have food. So it would have been an artificial story of me going to a government-run store buying, buying food and cooking it. It would have been fake. So I called New York and I said, I am getting out of Santiago and I'm going to my grandmother's family farm in Baracoa. So I ended up a car full of people, my aunts, 89-year-old, 88-year-old, uh, cousins, um, toilet paper because they didn't have it over there. I mean, whatever I could buy at the uh, dollar stores in, the, in, in Cuba. So I just loaded the car and we just headed towards the farm. When I had gone there as a child, I had gone on horseback with my dad. My dad was a painter and um, he loved painting uh, cacao pots and baracoa and I remember seeing a basket full of cacao pots that he had brought and he was painting it and he didn't want to cut the pots open. And in my mind, all I could imagine were Hershey kisses inside a cacao pot. Um, and that was my mental image. My father said, well, you, you know, I'll cut open the pots when we go back to the farm. So we went on horseback and that was amazing. And we went through the river, there, were, there was no road. So we, went, we hit a point where the river met the sea and then we went uphill to the farm. Well, I thought that because of the revolution and all these things that there, there would be a road to this farming community. No, so we had to go through the river, shallow river, you know, in the midst of a canyon. Well, we got stuck and then somebody helped us, somebody who came in a truck uh, just pulled us and when I reached the farm, I found people who looked exactly like me, you know, bushy eyebrows, same round face, um, this, you know, descendants of, you know, my, my great-grandfather who had settled uh, in that area in the uh, 19th century. Uh, and it was fantastic just to go back and see the cacao. And I realized that it was good cacao, genetically speaking, but it had a lot of problems because the government buys at a very tiny price. It, they dictate the prices. The farmer has no bargaining power whatsoever. And then they ferment and they dry. And um, I realized there were a lot of problems. It rains a lot during the harvest. So the quality could have been 10 times better. And in fact, I said so, and I sort of lamented the fact that I had helped so many people by that time, uh, small farms, that I could not do that with them. And I said, I planted the idea, you know, imagine if we take this cacao and we name it Ferrer, it's the family name and um, I can sell it together with your incredible Arabica coffee. They loved the idea and of course they were, you know, we were all dreaming. And then I had a problem with the government because somebody was listening to the conversation and they accused me of uh, disseminating imperialist ideas. So it was all very complicated, but that was a very crucial moment to go back. And, and that's what, um, that's the final uh, element of the research uh, stage of the book. Uh, 